Okay, so uh, dear auditoire, I'm uh, very pleased uh, to introduce a new cycle of uh, webinars for uh, the RN uh, Rita. So these uh, webinars will be called uh, RITA Research uh, Webinars uh, and are organized uh, in collaboration between the Working Group Research and uh, the Molecular uh, Testing Group. They should offer uh, the opportunity to present uh, projects, uh, to collaborate and uh, find uh, new partners for collaboration, uh, to prepare fundings and uh, to work uh, together on applications for European fundings. The first webinar today is on the HPO project. Uh, the second uh, webinar will be on the hyper-COVID-19 project. Today, as chair, I will introduce uh, briefly the working group research. Uh, then uh, Maria Jean, as chair, will introduce the uh, working group uh, molecular testing and the HPO project. So concerning the research uh, working group, uh, as a uh, several uh, working group among the uh, REN uh, RITA, is it, it is at the intersection uh, between uh, the different uh, disease uh, fields, uh, uh, primary immunodeficiencies, autoinflammatory disorders, autoimmune diseases as vasculitis and uh, pediatric uh, rheumatic uh, diseases. The main uh, purpose of uh, this uh, working group uh, is uh, to offer a platform uh, and uh, discussion uh, around uh, projects um, in uh, RITA, like, uh, for example, uh, next generation uh, sequencing technologies uh, projects or uh, projects around uh, novel cell and gene-based therapy, development of cytokine and antibody uh, therapies, uh, cutting edge uh, technologies for assessing immunophenotypings, uh, clinical uh, studies, epidemiological uh, studies or uh, social science. So it's uh, in uh, important um, relations and uh, cross-talking uh, with the other working uh, groups uh, and it should also offer uh, links and uh, bridges between uh, scientific uh, European organizations. The one of the main uh, purpose is uh, to harmonize and avoid duplications of efforts between uh, various groups uh, within uh, Europe uh, and uh, to allow uh, converging uh, pathways of research uh, so that groups uh, may find uh, new collaborations and easy ways to apply for European funding calls. So if a member uh, of RITA or an institution is interested, uh, it should contact uh, one uh, member of a uh, working group uh, research. The list is on the RITA website uh, and uh, discuss with her or him uh, so that the discussion uh, can be shared with the RITA board and stream leaders and the concerned uh, European scientific organizations uh, or uh, can benefit from the communication tools of RITA. Uh, to help and develop or make uh, more visible uh, European projects. On the RITA website attached to the working group, uh, there is a table uh, presenting uh, several uh, projects uh, ongoing uh, in uh, RITA. Some of these projects are uh, big uh, registries of patients, uh, others uh, focus on uh, genetic and omic diagnosis uh, as uh, the Immuned uh, project. Uh, uh, Maya and I uh, collaborate uh, for RITA to resolve the RD uh, project, which is an important European uh, project uh, recruiting, uh, uh, trying to uh, solve and solve the exome or genomes uh, already done uh, in rare diseases uh, to define a new um, genotype, uh, phenotype, or uh, uh, very rare uh, phenotypes. Uh. So now I'm leaving uh, Maria uh, presenting the, to present the molecular testing working group. Thank you. Maria? I was mute, I was muted, I'm sorry. 
So I, was, I still am Marielle van Gein, uh, the chair of the molecular testing working group. And next slide, please. Can you go to the next slide, Anne Sophie? Sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah. So the goal of our working group is a standardized and uniform European wide approach for the molecular diagnosis of monogenetic immune mediated disorders. So uh, that's, that's quite a, an ambition. And next to that, we want to ensure accessibility for state-of-the-art genetic diagnostics for all patients. And of course, because it's diagnostics, uh, it must be evaluated by audits against quality standards. And uh, the fourth important thing, I think, of the working group is that we want to collaborate. We collaborate with ACET and ESET because uh, there are many initiatives on the same subjects. And we do not wish to redo things. Uh, we, we do we collaborate on things, or we initiate new projects uh, that for the missing links uh, which we need to address. Uh, thank you. Next slide, please. So these are the current members. We have quite some some members. Uh, they all participate in the different projects of uh, of the working group. And uh, apart from that, we have some patient representatives from RUIPEC. Uh, to, to ensure that, that we are really doing uh, what patients re require us to do. And the co-chair uh, of my working party is Arkan Bostuk uh, from Vienna and Isabel Tuitu from Montpellier. Uh, so Arkan Bostuk is really uh, an immune deficiency uh, uh, person and Isabel Tuitu is, has a focus on auto-inflammatory disorders. Can I have the next slide, please? So uh, what kind of projects do we do? Uh, well, it's all, uh, all, of course, they all address our goals. So it's standardized and uniform. So we do contribute to molecular testing guidelines. So we did the ISIT guideline uh, for auto-inflammatory disorders. Uh, we also participate in recommendations for whole genome sequencing uh, for rare diseases. And uh, there was an application, a cost application from all different ARNs to strengthen research and diagnostic synergy uh, across the European countries for, rare, for genetic testing of rare diseases. Uh, so that we participate in. And can I have the next slide? Uh, of course, we, uh, the accessibility, uh, uh, of course, part of the accessibility is where can I find uh, the different testing? Uh, so uh, the first year we were active, we did a, uh, an, uh, an inventory on where genetic testing was performed. But uh, as we did not want to redo things, Orphanet is a really good site uh, that does offer uh, where you can see which genetic tests are performed where in Europe. So, so we didn't want to redo things and, and we didn't make our own list. So we didn't continue this uh, endeavor. I know the ACID uh, is looking for uh, testing to, to put genetic testing on their website. So maybe we can put a link on the AN and Rita website to go, to go to that side. No, I'm still at the functional testing. Uh, can I go on back? So next, because um, uh, genetic testing and functional testing go hand in hand. So if you find some genetic uh, variant in a gene, uh, sometimes functional testing is required. So we also thought it was very important we have a list of laboratories uh, with highly specialized functional testing uh, in the different uh, immune mediated disorders uh, on the lists. And those labs, they welcome centers throughout Europe. And this list, uh, we keep on updating it. Kimberly Gilmore is keeping uh, updating it every year. And it is published on the ARN Rita website. So if you're looking for a specific functional test, not the regular one, which can be done in all hospitals, but really specific for certain genes, then you can look at this list. And of course, it's not perfect yet. So, so if you have a list, please uh, get in touch with us so we can add it to the list to make it visible for you. Can I have now the next slide, please? So what we also do is evaluation against quality standards. Of course, it's diagnostics, it's not research. So uh, diagnostics lab have to perform external quality assessments uh, for the for the fee for the auto-inflammatory disorders. There was already uh, uh, international 
uh, external quality assessment available in, in, uh, for the, with the AMQN, but for primary immune deficiencies, that was not the case. So we contacted uh, the European Molecular Genetics Quality Network and, and we organized together a pilot for severe combined immunodeficiencies. So we started out on skits because also, the neonatal screening uh, is done by many labs in many countries. So we thought to start off, it would be good to have a, a, have a AQA for severe combined immunodeficiencies. So we have had a pilot in 2020, and then now this year, it has become an official AMQN skit scheme. And the, the people uh, who were part of the organization of the pilot now keep on participating in the assessment team. Of, uh, of the skid scheme. And what we discussed last time in our uh, group is that uh, uh, apart from uh, an uh, external quality assessment, we also need uh, actually DNA variant interpretation workshops because that was highly needed. It was also what came out of the EQA that a uh, first variant of unknown significance is hard to interpret, but also how do you report these variants? So we, uh, again, in collaboration with the ACIT and, and another one with the ESET, are trying to, to, to organize wor a workshop uh, where people can participate and, and, uh, uh, in, uh, yeah, on the DNA variant interpretation. Can I have the next slide? So, and the last project I would like to mention we are involved in is the Human Phenotype Ontology for Rare Immune Mediated Diseases. This was started out by uh, Kaan Bostok, at that time, the ACID Working Party Chair uh, of, the, uh, of the Genetics. Uh, together, uh, we engaged on this human phenotype uh, curation project with many others with, which were helping. And the, this will be presented today uh, by Julia Pasmandi and Matthias Heimel. Matthias Heimel is a uh, bioinformatician. Uh, part of uh, the Kaan Bostuk's group at the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute. Uh, very important in this project. And, and Julia Pasmandi was also a, a PhD student from the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute uh, from the group of Kaan. And she will also present uh, what we initiated here. So I would like then to introduce Matthias. Could you uh, explain us a bit more about HPO? I hope you can see the slides now. So, um, thank you very much for the kind of introduction, Maria. Um, so, my name is Matthias Heimel. Um, I'm a Biomedics Project Lead for Personal Medicine at the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for Rare and Undiagnosed Diseases. And today, I would like um, to give an introduction to gene, uh, phenotype, disease, and ontology and how they fit together. Um, if you have any questions, you can any time. Uh, Ask questions for the question pattern in the um, go to webinar um, part. So, human phenotype ontology uh, was mentioned before, and um, which uh, is uh, a vocabulary which provides uh, phenotypic abnormalities encountered in human disease. Uh, so, you have rare genetic uh, diseases which are usually described by a combination of phenotype and symptoms. So phenotypes in the, uh, describe this interaction of uh, its genotype with the environment, while uh, symptoms is more like a physical or mental feature, which indicate this of a condition or a disease. Um, here the phen phenotype ontology uh, is aimed at uh, medically relevant, uh, provide medical relevant vocabulary for clinicians, and is it already adopted by international rare disease organizations. So. Um, and human phenotype ontology uh, describes a set of phenotypes, uh, for example, recurrent viral infections, increased IgE level, or B lymphocytopenia, uh, but then there are also other ontologies or databases uh, which describe um, diseases like orphanet, uh, auto, auto, or omim, um, which, uh, for example, is combined immunodeficiency due to TOC8 deficiency. Um, and as was mentioned, uh, ICD 10 or 11 is the latest version. 
which is more in the uh, common diseases, but the whole um, um, uh, the whole collection of uh, diseases. Yeah, so it doesn't go into detail for for rare diseases. That's why these were established. And then if the gene ontology, which uh, describes the medical mechan mechanism of um, 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 so press the terms for this, uh, for example, regulation of GTPase activity or lymphocyte activation. So um, if you start with a symptom um, going from, from field type to disease, um, usually a um, clinician assesses the symptoms and then uh, looks uh, for the um, relevant disease, um, which is matching uh, to diagnose the patients, um, which is also linked to um, gene as a um, as molecular diagnosis. So the problem here is uh, if uh, the phenotypes don't uh, match uh, precisely disease, um, then um, the clinician um, consults um, I don't know, research articles in PubMed or consults um, colleagues uh, by email or phone uh, or conferences to find a uh, matching diagnosis for the patient. In the meantime, the patient uh, was probably does their own research and looks at Google, Facebook, Twitter, um, who knows, um, which is more instance compared to the uh, comprehensive research in through literature. So um, to combat, um, well, to help with this approach, um, we uh, at the ontology level where the symptoms um, translated into um, computer language, like uh, numbers and binary, um, which uh, so from the symptoms into the, um, the terms, uh, which are linked then uh, to diseases. Um, so you can take these terms and look them up, uh, which um, are the most, the most likely disease, give them a ranking, and to support the clinician to make the, um, a diagnosis based on this short listing. Um, the good thing is these disease databases have additional information like Google Ontology or other resources linked to the disease for further reading to make an informed decision. So um, the problems um, um, here, um, for example, the human phenotype pathology, you need detailed enough terms to fully describe the phenotype of a patient, while for diseases, you need sufficient annotation of the diseases to be able to map a phenotype of a patient to a disease. Yeah? Uh, and the other thing is the resources like gene ontology, um, which are annotating um, uh, the genes, for example, the question is, is the link between disease and gene, is it causal or, uh, or more association? So um, this needs still uh, further work, but uh, we made a huge progress in the recent years. Um, so how can this work? Um, so you have, um, for example, electric, uh, electronic health records or a clinician describing the phenotypes um, uh, directly uh, can be entered into the system, um, um, so entering the terms, or you can be assisted by uh, artificial, in artificial intelligence to extract, um, to um, assess the electric health records and translate this directly into phenotypic features, uh, like HBO terms. These can then uh, search across uh, disease uh, databases to find uh, uh, the, perfect, the best match, uh, giving a ranking, which hopefully provides you with the diagnosis. Um, if you have uh, an addition genome type data, like exome sequencing data or whole genome, this can be integrated into the search to provide the, molecular, the most likely molecular uh, diagnosis uh, for the patients. If this does not result in a um, um, sufficient um, diagnosis or um, yeah, any results, uh, this can be then um, shared globally um, in a secure manner to find additional patients which have similar uh, phenotypic or genetic features, yeah, um, which would um, be a matchmaker exchange, for example. This can be done instantly and it's, uh, can be optimized very easily. So um, why is this possible across, across the globe? Um, because HBO terms is, um, in the background, is just a number where the description hangs uh, off this identifier. So, and this um, label can be changed um, based, based on the country. So the different translations for different countries uh, to make it easier for clinicians to use them. Um, in addition, these are also translated into plain language for the uh, patients to actually understand, um, and understand uh, what uh, the terms uh, mean. Yeah. So HBO itself has 13,000 terms, um, has a hierarchical structure, is linked to disease databases, uh, and has translations in different languages or plain language. Um, you can think about it as a, 
as a, like a tree and like roots, um, but uh, the start is, uh, is the term is definitely to become a normality with the number HB0001118. Um, and if it's further down you go, as more specific, the term scans. Uh, for example, abnormality of the body height is a parent term of these two other terms like short stature or tall stature. So, and these terms further down always know um, the parent terms as well. So you can be as more and less specific, but it allows you to, to find uh, patients which are not as specifically annotated as the more specific uh, samples. Yeah. So I'm talking a lot about the fintech abnormality for HBO, human fintech ontology, but there are also other uh, parts of the ontology, um, which include clinic modifiers, frequency, past medical history, blood group, and mode of inheritance. And so the uh, first, the top two, uh, the clinical modifier and the frequency actually describe the fintech abnormalities. So uh, for example, frequency, how often it's seen in a disease population, or um, past medical history, plus group, which more describes the patient, whereas the most inheritance is more of a uh, of disease. So um, I'm more focusing on the typical normalities again. Um, so if you go one step down the hierarchy of the typical normality, parent nodes, you get uh, abnormality of voice, of the eye, of the head and neck, ear, limbs, breast, or genes in growth. Uh, um, which are very uh, obvious features, but then um, you can also go more detailed on the cardiovascular system, nervous system, nervous system, the chest system, which needs additional tests. Yeah. And if you go even further down, you get um, similar phenotype, um, blood tissue, immune system, um, neoplasm, or prenatal development of birth. Um, so they are um, the parent terms, a whole uh, network of um, terms underneath. Yeah. So, which allows you to further describe um, uh, the patient. So, this was already applied um, some years ago in, uh, in research, um, where the uh, HBO terms, the whole terms which exist, were expanded uh, for bleeding plating disorders. Um, and this study added 80 terms. Um, specifically, uh, they added the whole branch of abnormal platelet morphology and then um, added additional terms to immune system. Um, which then um, were encoded um, in the patients with HBO terms, which allowed them then to cluster the patients based on these terms. Just to visualize it, um, how this would look like, um, so these different clusters contained um, this, uh, on the left-hand side uh, 15 cases, where all of them had the same feature, one on the right-hand side. As far as down you go, as less um, patient you get, but um, overall the parent term uh, were more, more frequently uh, matched. So, um, and then they looked for genetic features in each cluster. And they, they also identified new causal genes. So, with this, um, I would just highlight it's um, you need detailed um, HBO terms to fully describe a patient, but also sufficient disease annotations to match a patient to a disease. Yeah. And uh, Instead of if you get started, it would be say, uh, if I rather say when do you get started, uh, do you find the type patients because the more patients are phenotyped, um, and the more likely it is undiagnosed patients actually getting diagnosed. And with this, I would like to hand over to my colleague, um, Julia. So thank you. Uh, Hello. Julia. They said Julie Pasman is the PhD student working on the the HPO project uh, from us. Uh, what we've done so far, and she will explain what we are uh, have done and and how we will continue. Thank you, Julia. Exactly. Thank you, Maria. If you cannot see my presentation, please let me know because I cannot see you, but I think you can see it. So yeah, uh, after Matthias's introduction, ah, thank you. Um, after Matthias's introduction to HPO, let me tell you about our Initiative optimizing HPO4 inborn errors of immunity specifically. So uh, there are many benefits of adapting HPOs for inborn errors of immunity because it unifies the nomenclature of patient phenotyping. It allows for very efficient data exchange between clinical teams or researchers and clinicians. It also allows for very accurate patient to disease or patient to patient similarity measures. 
It also serves as a unified nomenclature uh, to be used for databases or publications, um, such databases such as the Phenome Central or Gene Matcher. Uh, and finally, it also allows for more efficient variant prediction and gene discovery for those patients which are difficult to diagnose and exome sequencing is needed through tools such as Exomizer and Lyrical, which uh, in part rely on human phenotype ontology coded phenotyping of patients. So of course, now hopefully you've learned uh, about HPO a bit and you also uh, think that the, uh, it's adapting HPOs for immune er errors of immunity could be beneficial. However, it's not really done that often. HPOs are not really used in the community. And the reason for this is that HPOs are currently incomplete for uh, inborn errors of immunity. And there are a few problems. Uh, a lot of the times, terms are missing from the hierarchy. Uh, the structure of the actual tree is incorrect. Sometimes diseases are not annotated with HPO terms, or when they are annotated, uh, terms, phenotype terms are missing, or the terms that are used for the annotation are not really accurate. Just to show you a few examples of these, uh, so here you can see an example branch of the human phenotype ontology tree. Just, this is abnormality of immune system physiology. And when you just look at the first uh, child term, which is abnormal lymphocyte physiology, and look at the, the connected terms to that, you can just by quickly glancing at what is available as an annotating term or as a child term, you can see that at least abnormality of visa physiology is missing by first glance. And you can see uh, missing um, terms here also in the immunodeficiency branch. And furthermore, when you look at the terms that are in the same level of the hierarchy, so here on the left, and I highlighted them with different colors, you can see that there are very different types of terms in the same level of the hierarchy. So the structure is not really optimal. Um, furthermore, I said that very often diseases are not annotated with HPO terms or uh, when they are, the annotation is not complete. So here you can see the phenotypic description of ADAM-17 deficiency as per the International Union of Immunolog Immunological Society's classification. And if you query for the very same disease in HPO, you can uh, get a list of HPO terms that are linked to the disease. And this is what you find in HPO. And just by comparing this list that you find in HPO to the official phenotypic classification, there are clear terms that are missing from the HPO uh, description. So clearly this ontology needs a bit of shaping up, a bit of expanding, a bit of completion, and this is what we set out to do uh, with our initiative. So we started our initiative in 2018, headed by the LBI route, uh, but also the ERN Rita, uh, and also ESID. And we had two in-person meetings in 2018 and 2019, and a COVID safe meeting in 2020 so far. Uh, we have over 30 members across nine countries. And among these members are clinicians, geneticists, immunologists, but also computational biologists, such as Matthias or me. And uh, we have a remote working structure that is uh, uh, working well. And in addition to our two and a half in-person meetings, we had many other meetings. Uh, remotely. So with our initiative, uh, we have uh, now four work working groups, uh, which address different uh, subgroups of inborn errors of immunity. So we have a working group working on immunodeficiencies affecting cellular and humoral immunity, a working group on predominantly antibody deficiencies, a working gr group on immune dysregulation diseases, and a working group who tackles anti-inflammatory diseases. And with these working groups, we set out to restructure and complete the HPO tree and also to re-annotate inborn errors of immunity with HPO terms. Uh, we use a very hands-on branch-by-branch approach for the restructuring and completing the HPO tree, which we mostly did in our in-person meetings. And we have used an ontology-guided and machine learning-based uh, review and re-annotation of uh, diseases with HPO terms, which was coupled with an expert review. And I will now not go into detail how exactly we did this, uh, but just briefly, uh, we asked the working groups to collect uh, 
articles, case reports, or reviews that uh, describe the phenotypic spectrum of the diseases accurately. And we use a text mining tool to extract uh, phenotypic terms and to translate them to HPO terms. And this list of potential terms were sent to the experts for review. And they have reviewed them and we have evaluated their uh, verdicts and sent the updates to HPO. And uh, our group, of course, uh, is not finished yet, um, but I will show you our results so far. So as I said, um, the restructuring and optimizing the tree was mainly done in our in-person meetings using a lot of uh, whiteboards and note-taking. And after these sessions, we have summarized and standardized our notes and uh, sent our suggestions to HPO. This is an example of the HPO tree that we have touched and revised. So here are new term suggestions you can see in green and those terms which already existed in HPO but we have kind of repositioned them you can see in yellow. All in all, so far we have revised four main branches of the HPO tree and requested over 200 changes uh, which included the restructuring of 67 already uh, existing terms and the addition of uh, over 50 new terms. And the majority of our suggestions have already been implemented and are the part of the newest HPO release. So we have used our uh, ontology guided machine learning approach to reannotate uh, inborn errors of immunity with HPO terms. And so far we have reannotated 73 inborn errors of immunity. So the following results will be based uh, on these 73 diseases. So we have seen after our reannotation effort a marked increase in the number of terms available per disease. So uh, we actually saw a 4.7 fold gain in the number of HPO terms available per disease after reannotation. And this is not only a quantitative gain of the number of terms per disease, but we have also seen that this is actually a, a, a quantitative gain in the information available, the phenotypic information available uh, per disease, per uh, HPO. So after reannotation, we have uh, more information available per diseases. And if we look at the um, unified annotation of a disease now, after a reannotation effort, what we see is that actually the majority of the terms annotating a disease come from our text mining efforts. So it shows us that it's quite a powerful approach. There's of course uh, an overlap of the already existing uh, annotation and our text mining effort, but we have also asked uh, the experts during this review process to suggest additional terms if they felt like neither the existing terms or the terms coming from text mining really um, were accurate to describe the disease by themselves. So, of course, uh, our goal is here to uh, update and complete the HPO so that it's accurate and good enough so that the community uses it. And one of the very attractive uses of HPO is it's a, as a diagnostic aid to kind of aid in patient disease similarity matching. And to illustrate how our reannotation effort is helping in this, I will show you a single patient case. So we have a patient, call her patient A, who goes to the clinic with the following uh, problems. Uh, and uh, she is very lucky and she is treated by a very seasoned immunologist. And this immunologist looks at the patient, looks at, uh, at the clinical history, and immediately diagnoses the patient with common variable immune deficiency. Unfortunately, not all of us are seasoned immunologists. However, with HPO, what we can do is we can identify the phenotypic terms in the clinical description, translate them to HPO terms by here are the HPO codes, uh, codes for these specific phenotypic terms, and we can calculate the phenotypic similarity of the patient based on this set of HPO terms to the disease, in this case, uh, CVID. And what we have saw, uh, seen is that after our reannotation effort, the similarity of the, the set of patient HPO terms to CVID has increased. So now 
uh, phenotypically, the patient seems more similar to CVID, which was actually the genetic diagnosis of the patient. So of course, this is just one single case. So we wanted to put our uh, improvements and our re-annotation to the test. And we have actually uh, tested our re-annotation in a real patient cohort. So we took a cohort of 30 patients with inborn errors of immunity, different types, um, and extracted a set of HPO terms per patient based on their clinical summaries. And then based on this HPO uh, descriptions, we have uh, done disease uh, patient similarity measures. And what we have seen is that after our reannotation, the similarity of the HPO based phenotype similarity of these patients has very significantly increased to their actual genetic diagnosis. Furthermore, when we then ranked all possible genetic diagnosis for these patients based on uh, phenotypic similarity, we have seen that their actual correct genetic diagnosis ranked significantly better. So it came up as like the first one a lot more often than before re-annotation. Um, we are also uh, interested in seeing how our re-annotation effort affected uh, disease, disease similarity measures, because um, we want to, of course, uh, have a set of uh, disease annotations available that also reflect uh, clinical observations and also reflect biology. So what we did here is we clustered the diseases, and the, the here diseases are represented by their omen cones, uh, based on how phenotypically similar they were uh, one to one another based on uh, their HPO annotation before uh, our re-annotation effort. And here in the inside of the wheel, you see these color codes, and these color codes represent the clinical subgrouping of these diseases. And what we saw after our re-annotation effort, I think the first thing that is most uh, visible is that there are more diseases on this wheel because we have annotated diseases that had previously no annotation before. But also what you can see is that this wheel uh, in base, a uh, color-based wheel is becoming more homogeneous. So those diseases which belong to the same clinical subgroup tend to be more phenotypically similar uh, after re-annotation than they were before. So uh, this uh, takes me to my last, not my last, but one of my last slides. <laughs> So just to summarize, I think uh, um, what we can say that uh, although we have only launched this effort three years ago, we have already achieved some significant gains uh, in terms of the number of re-annotated diseases, but also the number uh, of tree restructuring events. And we have achieved substantial and meaningful gain in overall annotation and information content. And I illustrated how this gain can over immediately be applied to patient disease and disease disease similarity measures. And now we are looking into the future. Uh, our next uh, immediate goals is to, of course, continue our work to uh, continue reviewing uh, all diseases and all inborn areas of immunity to spread the word and uh, hopefully secure collaborations and funding. Um, and of course, our main goals are for HPOs to be complete enough to be used as a unifying nomenclature for databases, both internally and externally. And finally, uh, so that HPOs are used in the clinic. And with this, we would like to take a step towards data-driven medicine for inborn areas of immunity. And uh, what I also want to add is we are looking for new members. Uh, so we have four working groups so far, and I've already peaked at the audience, and I know that some of you are already members of one of these working groups. Um, but we're looking for new members of this already existing working groups, but also uh, we are looking for looking to start new working groups addressing other groups of inborn areas of immunity. And what our work uh, entails is basically, if you're a clinical expert, then a revision of phenotype information, and this is done with the guidance of group coordinators and, and, and leaders, um, and usually, well, this is depending on uh, what time it is. Sometimes there are more intense periods of time and sometimes there is more downtime. But I would say these entail monthly or bi-monthly conference calls. And our team, I think, or according to my experience, 
it's quite enthusiastic and a, a nice team and it, it's good to participate in these meetings and also we are also focused and very motivated to publish our results we are currently in the final stages of working up our first paper so hopefully um, we can show you that in a very short time and yeah so please let us know if you are interested please contact us so here the first email address is matthias's and marielle the second one uh, can uh, can also be contacted and and i also put my uh, email address here at last and i would say that maybe contact the first three people first because um, actually uh, i'm finishing my phd and uh, going on maternity leave in two weeks so maybe don't email me only if you want the, uh, the answer maybe a little bit later and because i think this this might be the last time that i'm presenting this project i would like to also give thanks to everyone matthias uh yeah it was great working on this so marielle and khan yeah i, I really enjoyed it and uh, also i'm a phd student so of course uh, i would like to thank both groups that i belong to for their time with me and yeah making me feel at home thank you very much okay because we are online and everybody is muted we cannot applaud but uh, i'm sure uh, <laughs> there will be huge sounds in every uh, living room or office uh, currently thank you very much julia and uh, i'd like you to Uh, thank you, Julia and uh, Matthias. Can you, we also have uh, Matthias uh, uh, in full picture? For there are some questions, uh, so people can still ask questions. Uh, let me uh, work this. There, hi, Matthias. Um, we had some questions in the in the question mark uh, there was one i will go to it okay this was the uh, regarding um if these annotations uh, make it to a database or where we deposit this information so um during the three years we worked on um we sorry, sorry, can, I, Matthias, can you maybe read the question would that be possible because i think uh, not maybe not everybody can um, so the question is that a lot of efforts of the existing Xiaomi database are data in a single database uh, such that they can be analyzed by the same pipeline. That's the first part of the question. So um, the, uh, the data we generated um, are of different of different types. They are all submitted uh, already submitted publicly. So um, the annotations, uh, the publications which we collected as a basis for the machine learning. Uh, they are submitted to um, Genomics England. They have a called, something called Panel Up, um, where these publications are linked to the diseases and, um, and uh, uh, to the genes as well. So, uh, and they already make a difference upgrading certain genes um, to uh, diagnostic grade. Yeah. So, this is the first level. Then, the second level is the HBO structure. This where we were submitted to HBO, and we're still working to get every single change in so this will work in progress but a, a large part is already in and released uh, uh, and the third is the annotation um, of these uh, um, diseases so we annotated OMIM um, diseases um, and submitted them again to HBO and this is part of the release cycle so um, most of the uh, changes we uh, suggestions we made they're already um, publicly available and hopefully make a difference already so um, why do we annotate OMIM? So OMIM is linked to Orphanet and other databases as well. So um, once you annotate it in one place, usually it makes its way through the other databases as well. Um, that was one part of the question. The other one uh, also because HBO terms and hierarchically will continue to be updated. Uh, yeah. um, will existing gene type uh, interest be automatically updated? So if a term changes or changes position, or um, some of the terms get um, archived, these will be linked to the new term. Yeah? So nothing is getting lost in HBO, um, but uh, everything gets um, moved on. So there's uh, no loss of information. If at all, the opposite, there's always a gain of information. 
And so um, once it's in HBO, it will be there uh, for long term. Hope this yeah, answers. Mm-hmm. And and can I add to that that indeed the disease the, the phenotypes of diseases change because a rare disorder has just been described. Of course, the, the phenotypic uh, outcome of this uh, gene defect can differ if uh, evolving more time and discovering more patients. So indeed, the, like the YUIS, uh, also uh, the HPO descriptions of diseases must be. Uh, curated every time and to, to be added uh, different phenotypes to it. So, uh, and that's a responsibility for the entire community to get that right. And it's, it's a difficult to, to get that done, but uh, the first steps first, of course. So uh, for the more, more common disorders, that's, that's already uh, crystallized. So that's already well described, but the, the rare just discovered disorders might still need some work in the coming years. I hope that answers your questions. Are there any more questions? I might want to add one more level to this. Um, since uh, the um, modifiers of diseases, there uh, uh, was a recent addition to HBO, so the frequency information in the, in the population. Um, this has not been done yet in uh, for all our diseases, but that's something we are really thinking how to integrate this best, um, which tools would support us to add this information easily. Yeah. So um, that hasn't been done yet, but it would also add a lot of um, information for matching a patient uh, to disease. Does this answer the questions being uh, set in the, in the chat then? Hmm. And otherwise you can email us to, to get better answers. Uh, I think... Sorry. Uh, Another question? I would, like to, I would like to ask a question. Um, I sent it uh, because when I saw when I saw your your work, I just wonder: Do you think that the HPO classification uh, could uh, improve a lot the the surprising or heter- heterogeneous results concerning the correlation uh, phenotype genotype? I mean. Uh, in the clinic, we are um, we are often surprised that uh, people are presenting with different phenotype, and they have at the end the same uh, genotype, the same mutation. Do you understand what I mean? So, do you think this could be improved by the HPO classification? May May I uh, have a go at this? So, it's it's not that the 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 HPO. Uh, itself by itself improves this but an accurate phenotypic description of diseases in hpo would improve this and the more information the more patients we base these descriptions on the more accurate the phenotype genotype uh, matching would be because i think so what what we have also tried to do uh, with our effort is to be very inclusive to for 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 example from case reports from uh, from reviews that describe multiple diseases to include all the phenotypes that could be possible because a lot i think a lot of the times uh people of course expect the very kind of the more frequent phenotypes for a disease whereas it could be that uh, a few patients were already published to present with kind of a, a, a different clinical picture but maybe they were not included in the annotation so what we try to do is to include everything and I, uh, if we we are able to revise all diseases with this same uh, approach, but to, to be very inclusive and to include all phenotypes, then this phenotype to genotype correlation and matching would be a lot more accurate. I think you're muted. Okay, thank you, and also for your uh, very nice presentations. You're welcome. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, uh, then we'd like to conclude. Indeed, it's within the hour, so that's a very good thing. Uh, by thanking, of course, the presenters uh, and in, uh, for the nice uh, presentations. Um, of everybody who would like to contribute to the HPO project, please contact us.
Um, and uh, Anna, Anna Sophie and me will organize several more uh, uh, seminars, so please join them as well. The next seminar uh, organized by Eyre and Rita will be the COVID-19 vac vaccination for pit and rare autoimmune diseases. This is the 9th of April. Uh, so oh, please uh, join us there as well. And uh, I would like to thank the audience for, uh, uh, for listening to us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.